Well, Happy New Year. Happy 2022 to everybody out there watching. So glad you're here. Please take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that notification bell. Share this sucker out and do leave a comment before you check out today. Going to be talking with my buddy Cameron Pasha once again. We're going to start a bit of a series here, our outlook on some things coming up in 2022, business changes, uh, Hollywood changes, movies, television show changes. So the topic of conversation today kind of leans more heavily in towards Disney Plus, specifically with recent entries like Hawkeye and newly the book of Boba Fett just in the last week, which doesn't seem to be going on the surface terribly well in terms of ratings on Disney Plus, and this may bode ill going forward. Has the Star Wars fandom really just fled and abandoned things? Will the magic of Mandalorian Season 2 ever really come back? Don't know. Well, today we're going to talk to Cameron. He and I are going to share our thoughts on some of this and even some other topics as well. Stay tuned for this and more episodes to come as time goes on this month in January. Here we go. All right, folks, welcome back and happy new year to everybody out there watching. Happy 2022. Hope you had a great New Year's and hope 2022 is even better than 21. And joining me today for the very first show on Valiant Renegade of 2022 is my buddy Cameron Pasha. Cameron, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, Valen. I'm really excited for the show tonight. I'm excited for uh, 2022. I believe, uh, you know, that it'll be a better year across the board for us. I think we'll still have some challenges from the last couple of years, both in our lives and in our entertainment. But I remain hopeful that it's going to we're in an upswing now. I do, too. And, you know, you and I have talked on a number of occasions here on the show, and, and people really do seem to love this. And before I continue, yeah. please make sure you go check out Cameron on his Patreon. Great place to go. Has some great articles. And I have to apologize to everybody out there. And Cameron, I've been so busy the last couple of two or three weeks. We have not had time to do this because and I haven't made that many videos in the last couple of weeks. End of the year for me is always cuckoo. Yeah. But I agree with you. I think 2022 is going to bring some big surprises. I think we're going to see some changes here and there, hopefully for the better, yeah. uh, because of what we've gone through so far with 2021, all the, the <laughs> stuff that we've talked about. And in relation to this conversation today, you know, we've had some new stuff coming out from Marvel. Spider-Man is doing amazingly well. The last mm -hmm. three or four videos I've done have been about Spider-Man's box office, which yeah. went to prove the point that, that I've talked about, that you've talked about. Hollywood has got a content problem. And mm -hmm. then we have a movie like this come out and just blows the doors off the box office. The pandemic excuses are over. And we've had some shows come out on Disney Plus recently, both from Marvel, now from Star Wars. I want to talk a little bit about that. We've mm -hmm. had Hawkeye. We've had yep. Book of Boba Fett. Disney Plus has been struggling the last few quarters to increase subscribers. We know yep. they need a lot of new content to really push that. Bob Chapek, in fact, there was an article today, I believe, I was looking at. I have to go find it again. Uh, but it was it was talking about some – actually, I think it was the Matthew Baloney piece from Puck. You mm -hmm. might want to look at that yep. uh, as we discuss this, talking about basically what you were saying a few weeks ago, how mm – -hmm. Now that Iger will be stepping aside, he's gone. He was saying that he really wants to see the reins come off of Chapek yep. and how much changes are going to happen in Disney. All this plays into the conversation today. So, Cameron, first of all, how was your New Year's? And then let's talk about what we're going to see in 2022. Well, my New Year's was very simple. You know, stayed up late to watch the ball drop. You know, you know, it's pretty quiet here in Los Angeles because, you know, they're still – this is one of the more frightened cities in America, so they're still very restrained about how to handle life right now. So I'm looking forward to hopefully some of that veil being lifted this year. But if not, then I'll take some nice trips to, uh, to the south, to, to Florida and Georgia and other places, you know, Tennessee, which seem like a lot more fun right now. But, but, but you know, with, with all that, I'm, I'm looking forward – to uh, like I said, what what entertainment has to uh, offer us? I think I think we're off to an interesting start with some with some successes and not and some not so great successes that we'll talk about. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be coming up, and I think there's a lot that we've seen so far to kind of give some some hints at what we might see mm -hmm. going forward. So first off, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started the 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 uh, the recording tonight. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe kind of go in chronological order. So yeah. if, uh, about a month and a half ago now, 
the Hawkeye show started. So let's mm -hmm. talk about Disney Marvel first. Yep. We'll get into Disney Star Wars because this is the next thing because 2022 is supposed to be a, a big re-energizing year for the mm -hmm. Star Wars franchise. Allegedly, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, but as far as Marvel goes, we got Hawkeye. And Hawkeye comes out to, let's say, less than envious results in terms of streaming numbers. Yeah, mind, uh, it's forty from what we understand from Samba TV numbers at least. Mm -hmm. It's forty percent lower than Loki, so that you know that is the, the lowest that MCU has uh, that has produced at least last year in it, in this efforts, which is uh, which is unfortunate because I, I I finally watched the show. I had left Disney Plus after a lot of the dramas that happened last year. I just was tired of it. I left. I came back to check out Hawkeye because I'm a big fan of Haley Steinfeld. I think she's a huge actress. You know who's going to be leave a real mark uh, in. You know, and I was I was kind of underwhelmed by the show, and uh, but I was told by others it's better than the other stuff they made. I'm like, all right, <laughs> so so that's the best they've got. Okay, yeah, I, I and and that seems to be the consensus that everybody with with Hawkeye seems to be well, take it or leave it. Uh, but from a business standpoint, this did not seem to yeah. give Marvel the jolt that they really needed, and they're coming off of a rather poor box office showing okay. for Black Widow. A yep. rather poor box office showing for Shang Chi, and a very poor box office showing for Eternals. Mm -hmm. um, the Disney Plus stuff so far to this point this year, in terms of Marvel, seems to have been rather ho hum, tepid yeah. at best reception by audiences. Um, they haven't really had a theatrical release from Disney proper this year that has really turned a profit at the box office. Um, it ain't looking good right now. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not looking good. And, you know, they, they had a bad quarterly call where the number, you know, where the investors weren't impressed with the discussions of where the streaming numbers are. And, you know, they lost Disney, as you know, Disney done videos about, about a Disney share price plummeted last year, much worse than I think people expected. And uh, so they need to really get off the ground strong in 2022. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's starting off the way they need it to. It doesn't seem to be, no. And I know some people, you said you watched, I, in all fairness, I really haven't watched Hawkeye, to be honest. Yeah, and I, I watched the whole show. I watched, that's the only one of the MCU shows. I haven't watched Loki or, or, <laughs> or WandaVision. I watched Hawkeye, like I said, because I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of both uh, uh, of both Miss Steinfeld and Florence Pugh. I think I, I actually love Black Widow. Uh, I thought it was a great movie. I liked her in it. Uh, and, you know, the, mo the show would have been better had Florence Pugh been there from the beginning because it picks up when she shows up near the very end, so... Yeah, and that's funny. I was kind of the opposite. I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I stuck through WandaVision. Mm -hmm. I suffered through Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and then I really suffered through Loki. <laughs> and I was, I, by the end of it, I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. I can't, I just, I can't watch anymore. You were not alone, apparently. Yeah, You're and I mean, alone. I love Jeremy Renner. <laughs> yeah. I love the character Hawkeye. Um, and I mean, even initially, I was like, do I want to watch a whole show just about Hawkeye? Yeah. I mean, is this really, okay, I mean, I'll get, but then the other three MCU shows came through. Mm -hmm. And I saw Black Widow, and I saw Shang Chi, and I'm like, this. If this is Phase Four, I'm I. Just, I got better things to do, y'all. Sorry, mm -hmm. Marvel. Sorry, I got better things to do than this. This is boring. Now I love Spider Man No Way Home. That was actually a well done movie. And I realized that Marvel and Kevin Feige had a had a big hand in the production of that. Still a Sony film making all the money from it. But in terms of Marvel proper right now, it doesn't seem like they have a whole lot of of of, of interest and. Up until the season finale of um, of Hawkeye and all the way through it, like you said, the Sama numbers have been pretty terrible, yeah. um, at least in terms of other things. This is not the kind of thing in terms of this conversation mm -hmm. that Disney Plus really needed to, to, to punch the drive switch on this and really get Disney Plus moving again. They did not have that many big seminal properties come out on Disney Plus this year. They each yeah. one of these, each one of these movies or these TV shows had to be a hit. I don't know if they've had a single one this year that was, and and they really didn't have much success at the box office either. It's just been a rough 2021 for Disney. It's been a rough 2020. Let's be frank, it was a rough 2020 as well because oh, yeah. you know, they they started off really strong, you know, with this uh you know with with this whole this whole situation with the Mandalorian and then and then you had the Luke Skywalker thing. They became a global phenomenon. And then you had the, the nonsensical drama around Gina Carano, which which took all the air out of the balloon. And it looks like the air hasn't been filled back in. No, it really hasn't. And 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 on that, kind of getting into the Star Wars side of things. Yeah. 
you know, because this has been more recent, I'm going to pull this up. And I found this interesting. You and I were discussing this today. So just yesterday on uh, that park place, mm -hmm. WDW Pro, mm -hmm. who has been around quite some time, and he's more right than he is wrong, for sure. He's definitely connected. He certainly has his sources. He does. So this article came out yesterday. And this was January 2nd, The Disaster Looming, The Book of Boba Fett Beaten by the Matrix. Now, when this came out on Sunday, yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, as we record this, the deadline articles, the Samba TV numbers, nothing had been released yet. Nothing. Yeah. And the bottom line is with this is that WDW Pro claims that he'd been hearing the Book of Boba Fett was not doing well with the streaming mm -hmm. numbers, at least not as well as Disney would like. Uh, the viewership numbers were coming in on the low side. They didn't have final numbers yet. Uh, you know, so on and so forth. Obviously, the show could pick up. But we're just talking about the pure numbers here, okay? But he says, there's an industry acquaintance of mine that made a suggestion. I couldn't ignore any longer. Do a Google Trend search for Spider-Man No Way Home, the book of Boba Fett, add in Matrix Resurrections, giving him basically, here's people that are looking for movie tickets, Mm -hmm. and Matrix Resurrections that nobody was seeing that weekend, which we already yeah. knew, which is a current big property that's out, but nobody's really looking to go see it in a theater. So you're really just getting raw Google searches for what is this movie? Yeah. Well, everything was beating Book of Boba Fett badly, like 100 to 1 in the case of Spider-Man and 25 or 50 to 1 in the case of The Matrix, which, of course, was not doing very well at the box office. So he comes up with the Google numbers in here, and even factoring in the Matrix has some people somewhere searching for tickets. This was crazy. Can it be that the Book of Boba Fett is even less successful than my contacts were suggesting? Have people truly turned off the television when it comes to Disney Plus and Star Wars content? And we've been seeing this all year. We've been seeing a lot of people in this community talk about, especially after the whole Gina Carano situation, that they were done. And that mm -hmm. nothing was going to bring them back. Well, it may be bearing out at this point because this is obviously yeah. the first big Star Wars show we've had. This, this was the test. You know, you know, Valiant, yeah. one of the rules that we have in the industry is it doesn't matter what last night's ratings were. What matters is what next week's ratings are going to be. So, you you know, like well, I work on the show Bionic Woman on our premiere. Everyone want to check out the new Bionic Woman NBC, you know, 30 years after the original. And so we had something like 16 million viewers. And then the next week after that, we had 8 million viewers. And the week after that, we had 4 million viewers. So clearly people tune in, don't like what they saw, and didn't come back. So the fact is that, you know, that we have these results after, you know, we haven't had a Disney show since this epic moment at the end of The Mandalorian second season where Luke Skywalker, like I said, global phenomenon, everyone's cheering, YouTube videos of people crying worldwide as they mm -hmm. see Luke Skywalker return. And at the end of that episode, you see the Book of Boba Fett, which people are already emotionally hyped for because they just watched this incredible episode with Mark Hamill coming back with his green lightsaber and destroying droids. And now they're hyped for this. And then, you know, six weeks after that, you have Ms. Crono being fired and the nonsensical drama for a year after that. This is now the next week's ratings. You've got the next show that had been hyped up by The Mandalorian and by Luke Skywalker's return. But a year later, this is the result we're getting. Yeah. I mean, th this is it. This is people walking away. And I highlighted yeah. this. This is the last thing before I want to move on to the deadline piece mm -hmm. that uh, that came out. This is, today. again, this is what he was hearing. The deadline piece later confirms what he's hearing. 24 hours later, this was confirmed. And Canto versus the Book of Boba Fett. Now, he has a, he has a link in here that he did a, uh, a Google spread on, I believe. Let me pull this up. And this shows, here we go, mm -hmm. in Canto. Yeah. In blue, the Book of Boba Fett in red, the Matrix Resurrections in yellow, which I think, and again, pulling Spider-Man out is a fair comparison. That thing is a is a rocket. I mean, that thing, just yeah. there's no comparison. Yeah, that, that's just here. an outlier. You can't use that for anything. But these exactly. are, you know, you've got things that we have assumed are not part of the general conversation anymore. In Kanto, in yeah. the Matrix, Matrix didn't do well. In Kanto, did okay, but it's not, no one's talking about it anymore. Right. So you would expect the Book of Boba Fett which has been hyped up about a major character that I've certainly loved since I was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'd expect it to do better than this graph that we're seeing. 
Yeah, and I want to call to everybody's attention where I'm pointed right now. Now, of course, I'm in Central Standard Time. Mm -hmm. So this, this Google chart is coded to my time zone as I pull it up. What's important about this is that December 29th, 2 a.m., Central Standard Time, is when Book of Boba Fett dropped. This was when it premiered. This would have been at its peak, which is what you can see here. The red mm -hmm. is Book of Boba Fett. In Kanto, who had come out five days before on Disney+, Plus, mm -hmm. which had been in theaters already at this point for 35 days, had been now on Disney+, Plus for free, for five days. Was almost two to one at this point in Google search trends over Book of Boba Fett. The Matrix Resurrections at this point, which was already a confirmed failure by this point, was about half as much, again, as Book of Boba Fett. So, I mean, you look at this kind of stuff, and look here, even December 28th, just three hours before Book of Boba Fett premiered, mm -hmm. Matrix is basically right there on par. So you look at the Google search trends, and I th I've looked at this before with several Disney Plus shows. In fact, Loki was one of them, if I'm not mistaken, when mm -hmm. I did this about six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we saw. And you look at the times of day, you see the peaks and valleys, and that's normal. I mean, you know, you, you go to the middle of the day, you go to night, people are looking for movie tickets. January 1st, we're on a Saturday night, okay? Uh, or, or people are looking for stuff to watch at home with the family versus 6 in the morning. But mm -hmm. you look down here, you look how much further down the pike that Book of Boba Fett is. This is a major, quote-unquote, major Star Wars event, and here's where we are. And it goes to show exactly what, what WDW Pro is being told, and then 24 hours later, yeah. we get this sucker. Here we go. Here we go. 3.18 p.m. Central Standard Time today, uh, Monday, uh, January 3rd. This is where we are. This is just a few hours ago as we record this, basically confirming almost, I'd say, 100% of the information WDW Pro was being given. See now, but look at the look at the time. I, I wrote about this on my Patreon because we've talked mm -hmm. about the trades, particularly this trade, uh, being you know sort of spokespeople for the club and for the popular crowd and all that. So they gotta they gotta spin things to make it look good for for Disney, right? So the, the headline is the book of Boba Fett premieres viewership thirteen percent higher than Hawkeye. So if you just are casual thing like, hey, it sounds like it's doing good, right? Well, we just established that Hawkeye was 40% off of Loki. Hawkeye was the least. So saying something is 13% higher than, the, than something that was at the bottom of the barrel is not impressive. And then buried in the article is the actual figure we'll talk about, which is that in reality, it is 32% down from Loki. So it's not 40%. It's 32% right. down from Loki. That's, that's the buried lead there in the story. And that basically puts it numerically and metrically on par Mm -hmm. Roughly with WandaVision, which was the first big Marvel property that came out, I think with 1.5 or 1.6 million. It's a little closer to that in terms of Hawkeye's mm -hmm. premiere. Um, but yeah, this was not a great start for this at all. And and again, just to be fair, a lot of the Sama TV metrics, for those of you out there that are terribly familiar with them, um, they're not gospel. They're not written in stone. Um, but they are, however... I'd say at least the most consistent metric that we have for streaming programming. And it's really the only one we have at this point. Nielsen is so far behind the line, it's not even funny. Um, mm -hmm. It usually takes Nielsen roughly a month yep. to release streaming data, and they only do it in terms of millions or slash billions of watch hours, not mm -hmm. actual household eyeballs. Yeah, uh, so they're, they're a getting show. a conglomerated figure. Right, right. At the, right. At, the, at the level that they that they feel is a value, which I'm not sure that's the proper level, but that's what they're doing. Right, and my thing is with Samba is that even though Samba's numbers may not be 100% pitch perfect, the good thing about Samba is, like I said, they're consistent, and we can at least gauge from one Samba measurement to the next. Yeah, it's 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 a measuring stick. If yeah. we know that Loki did this on Samba, and we know that that, that you know that uh, Hawkeye did this, and we know that Boba Fett did this. We know at least the people who are watching Ensemble, we know their preferences. And there's over a million people. That, so it's a good sample size. Yeah, I think they have three million households where they have their service active. And mm -hmm. in my understanding of what Samba does, and again, for our new viewers yeah. out there, we have quite a few of you. Uh, what Samba does, and you can follow them on Twitter on Samba TV, 
is that they then take the data that they collect and they basically measure what you watch in five minute increments. So they see on your screen, okay, uh, Loki or Boba Fett or Hawkeye was on your television screen for five minutes. That's how they measure it. You're watching it. So that's what they take as a measurement. They then extrapolate that out through whatever algorithm or algorithm or metric that they use to the national population to determine this is how many people in the U.S. watch this. So this to is how many clarify, people in the UK watch this. Yeah. To clarify, so if I'm watching a show on Samba for two and a half minutes and I shut it off, that's not going to be tabulated as a view, correct? According to what Samba says, correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Five Maybe minute watch. Five time. minutes is fair. I think five yeah. minutes in a in a thirty minute show, five minutes is enough. You're either invested in it or you're not invested in it. Yeah. Correct. And I mean, by comparison, and I know they've changed this. Netflix used to be thirty seconds. If you watch yeah, something for 30 seconds, it was like that considered a view. And it's, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, not just, that's they just changed that since then yeah, that's uh, to be a little bit more right. So anyway, so here we go with this article and let's look at this because this gives us a little bit more specificity in terms of the numbers, which I find interesting. And again, folks, this may not hold. We're not saying that Boba Fett's a bad show. We're not saying it's a good show. We're literally just talking about the numbers here yeah. and what this you implies. Know, and I can talk about yeah. Some creative things at some point that may have affected the numbers, but yeah. So let's but yeah, let's look at the numbers. We are going to get to that because I, I I've watched it. I've watched it. I'm I'm invested in the show. I and like you, I didn't. I don't know if I thought the first episode was great, but we'll get to that and we're going to talk about that. But and again, at this point, it's just the business metrics. So here we go. When it came to the Wednesday through Sunday viewership of Disney Plus, Lucasfilm's Book of Boba Fett, one point seven U.S. households. Again, roughly the same. Number of households that watched WandaVision way yeah. back in January uh, tuned in to learn more about the mysterious bounty hunter's origin. Um, the audience for Book of Boba Fett. Now, I will stipulate this dropped on a Wednesday. Now, all these other shows that have premiered, WandaVision, Falcon, Loki. Well, Loki, I think, actually premiered on a Wednesday. But mm -hmm. I think the other ones all had episodes come out on Fridays. Yeah, so, so that, we the weekend. Yeah. So do these figures take into account several days or is just one night? This is my understanding, the 1.7 households. Well, this is the problem. I don't know. I don't think that Samba has officially released these. Like Deadline had early mm -hmm. access to these numbers. Usually when I see Samba, um, actually, I take it back. It's right here. Audience for Book of Boba Fett. It is the five-day premiere. So measured by Samba TV, 46 million TV devices with a panel right. of 3 million smart TV households who watched at least – is what it's supposed to say, at least five minutes. All right, so over five days. So we've got right. you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's that's fair. That's enough. Yeah. I think if you're gonna watch the show, you're gonna watch it by Sunday. I think that's fair. Typically so, but I'm just I'm just mentioning out there that some of these other premieres yeah. did premiere on a Friday versus a Wednesday. Yeah. Sometimes that can change things a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, technically, I think if it premiered on a Wednesday, I would think it would have a higher number of watches than if it had premiered yeah, on a Friday. Yeah, because we have extra weekend. time. It's, it's like yeah. a Thursday for previews or whatever. Uh, but the people that are going to watch it over the weekend are going to watch it over the weekend. And this five-day window includes that weekend. So I don't know that it, that it's in any way inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah. So Loki was the first prominent Disney Plus Marvel series to drop on a Wednesday. There we go. And I, I really, folks, I had not read this article that carefully before we started. My apologies. But again, like I said, I knew one of them had premiered on a Wednesday and I figured it was Loki, but I knew WandaVision had was with Fridays. That series still ranks as the highest five day premiere. So then uh, there's no excuse. Then 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 Wednesday no. could work. Wednesday could work. Absolutely. Uh, and, and again, we just talked about Hawkeye and yeah. Hawkeye paced in at one point five million. So it's this is the bottom line is that it really seems like it's not just, and I've been saying this, you've been saying this all year, we've been talking about this, it's not just the number of subscribers you have. How engaged are they on your service? And consistently, the thing I've seen from Disney+, Plus, and this is the thing that they're going to have to address in 2022, folks, the amount of, of interaction with Disney+, Plus. they have 118 million worldwide subscribers. Mm -hmm. Almost 40% of those subscribers are in India paying roughly 65 cents a month for okay. the service. Yeah. Uh, not a you, huge, not a huge uh, cash flow for them. Yeah, it's not. They're making money on advertising and Disney is about to have to drop billions more in India this year in investments to repurchase their cricket uh, live sports contracts okay. to re up them. It's yeah. coming. Disney can't afford to let those go because if they no, let those it's go, it's a cultural phenomenon. They have to be involved. It in. is. And if they let that contract slip to somebody else, 
then all those subs they just mm-hmm. got are going to go out the door. Um, so that's that's another video. But point being with this is they really don't have when you look at the size of Disney Plus and you compare to some of the views that places like Netflix and other other places get for the shows they put out. Disney Plus is really not pulling their weight. Uh, you know, you got 118 million subs. You're talking about the Matrix that got 2.8 million, according to Samba. Mm-hmm. 2.8 million views uh, for the Matrix Resurrections. As much as the movie was, in my opinion, awful. Um, they, 2.8 million views in the first five days. And, and, and HBO Max has roughly the same number of subs, give or take, as Disney Plus does in the U.S. And these are U.S. numbers we're looking at. So substantially higher viewership for that. When people could have seen it in the theater or they could have sat at home and watched it, which most of them seem to do, Disney's struggling with this. So, I mean, what do you, you saw the Book of Boba Fett. You watched the first yes. episode. What, what did you think? Would you, if you want just creatively, again, we don't have to go into spoilers, but I'll mm-hmm. give a general thought here. Uh, you know, look – I, to be very honest, was disappointed. Uh, I went in very hyped. Uh, I really liked The Mandalorian. I had not watched The Mandalorian because I had been boycotting Star Wars ever since The Last Jedi. I didn't watch Solo or anything else. And then when I heard that Luke was back, I literally waited to the end of the second season. When I heard Luke was back, the next morning I subscribed to Disney. Uh, and I, I binge-watched the entire Mandalorian, and I very much liked the show. Right. Uh, and so I was very hyped up for this. Uh, you know, I liked what they did with Boba Fett in The Mandalorian. So I was hyped up for what they were going to do with him here. Uh, you know, the, visually, it's stunning. Robert Rodriguez is a stunning director. There's some great action sequences, uh, you know, some really good fight sequences. The major issue for me, and I wrote about this on Patreon, is that uh, at least the pilot episode that I saw didn't feel like the Boba Fett I know. Um, it was, you know, he is, he's essentially becoming the godfather. That's, that's just that he's taken over Jabba, Jabba's, you know, empire that, you know, that is, that has sort of gone to Pete in the, since Jabba died at the turn of the Jedi. And he's taken it over. And the pilot is about him to sort of try and establish his authority. And it, there's no hint in the pilot as to why he's even doing this. Because for me, Boba Fett is is a is a lone gunman figure out there doing his thing, trying to you know like like his father, like his cloned in the, from whom he's cloned, Jango Fett. He's just a simple man trying to make his way in the galaxy, right? And so uh, that's all he is. And for him to take on the responsibilities of of running a criminal empire uh, is a big deal, you know. And it, much of the episode is about those responsibilities. And so it's. Had I been asked to write the show, uh, which I wasn't, but had Mr. Favreau brought me into the writer's room, I would have said, I think we need to at least have a hint that there is a reason behind Boba Fett w- doing this. And I'm sure over the course of this show, we will find out his reason because there is, without spoilers, there is a flashback structure where half the show takes place in the present moment, half the show takes place uh, in the moments after Return of the Jedi and the Sarlacc pet and all of that. And you, you clearly there's going to be a separate adventure that we're going to see how he got to this place. And likely the arc of that previous, ad- the past adventure will tell us why he's motivated to do this now. That's like, but even with all that, it, it's worth establishing, even if it's, uh, you know, his sidekick character there who says to him, you know, boss, is this really what you want? Well, a simple line like that. Uh, and he says, trust me, we know he's got a plan of some kind. He's got some agenda here. None of that was there. It was just, a, this is what he's doing. And okay, it's not the Boba Fett I knew. And uh, the lack of that character development pulled me out. Uh, and I felt it was too rushed. There was no reason for it to be about a 30-minute episode. I was invested enough that I was stuck around for a full hour or 45 minutes, whatever they wanted to give me. And it felt like it was cut off very quickly and unnecessarily. So those are my critiques. I will say this, you know, it's uh, – I'm happy to be able to critique that because th- that's storytelling stuff. I didn't feel that it had any kind of woke agenda. I didn't feel it had any kind of bizarro deconstruction of Star Wars agenda. You know, the issues I have are purely on story. You know, people criticized uh, the prequels on story, and George Lucas is the creator of the myth, so you can't say he doesn't know the myth. It's his myth, right? And so you can criticize on story. So I will say I'm happy that we're not having this argument of like Mr. Johnson coming in and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're having a discussion about story. But I think the combination of my conversation, there's a few friends of mine, like our good friend Stephanie Janicek, passionately loves Boba Fett, is out there, you know, very strongly saying this is a great show. And, you know, you know, the character is exactly what I expected to be wonderful. You know, I'm not exactly there yet. And most people I talked to felt something was lacking uh, in the show who had watched it. And it, for me, it wasn't as entertaining as The Mandalorian. Even the pilot episode of The Mandalorian was very entertaining. 
I mean, it pulled me in. And part of the mystery of not seeing the Mandalorian's face here, you've got Boba Fett walking around with his mask off the whole time, right? His helmet off. And so, you know, it's, you know, the, the whole mystique of Boba Fett is, is the helmet and that's kind of been blown on the Mandalorian, right? So you can't really do that or, or it's not as effective now. So, so you've got these issues here. My hope is that storytelling wise, uh, it's going to pick up and it's going to become a very compelling show, which I think Mr. Favreau is more than capable of. Uh, and I certainly hope he has a plan for that. But that the story issue for those that watched, I think most people had some story issues with it. I think there was also, as we read the comments on that WDW Pro article, uh, most of those comments are, you know what? I I was... I love the Mandalorian. I love Luke Skywalker coming back. I was so hyped for Boba Fett. And then they fired Gina Carano in this disgraceful fashion, which is why I left Disney Plus, right? I, 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 the moment that happened, I, I canceled my subscription. I had my subscription for all of three weeks. I, I, I subscribed to watch the Mandalorian and I, and I unsubscribed when that happened to Gina. I came back now, but I'm not, I don't feel a large mass group followed me back <laughs> and so that's the issue is and I, I think you know it's not just drama i think people really were hurt by this the way miss Corona was handled and the politics of it and just the disgraceful energy that pulled all the air out of that wonderful moment from Luke skywalker returning i think it's just we're, we're seeing the damage of that it's much greater than people realized and i think disney now realizes the damage no i i think you're absolutely right i think there's an amazing amount of distrust for the Star Wars brand at this point among the fans. And there has been, uh, not only since Gina Carano was, you know, publicly humiliated or at least mm -hmm. attempted to be humiliated yeah. by Lucasfilm by saying, yeah, we're not going to renew her contracts anymore. She'll never be back. I think it stems back, obviously, to the sequel trilogy, what they did to Luke Skywalker yeah. there. There is an inherent amount of distrust for the leadership at Lucasfilm or at least the, the, you know, the supposed alleged leadership at Lucasfilm with whatever powers Kennedy yeah, still the, has. The nominal leadership, the nominal leadership. Yeah, the nominal leadership, whatever she's doing over there. Uh, because, you know, with, with her seemingly still floating around, at least by lack of any other information that she has that she has been retired, that there's a lot of people out there that, that, that say, and I don't blame them, and I've told them this. Obviously, you know, friends you and I have on YouTube and places like this. I don't blame anybody for being embittered towards Star Wars. That's not their fault. That is Disney's fault. Yeah, and it's, and it's not just one incident. Yeah. It's years yeah. of suffering. I've said that on my exactly. Patreon article. People yeah. are tired of this. People are just want to enjoy Star Wars, and it's been emotionally draining the garbage, the mm -hmm. ringer that we've all been put through. There's no reason for this ringer. Just you could have made good. We know from Rogue One and from The Mandalorian, you can do this. You can make good stuff if you just want to. So this unnecessary emotional ringer all of us have been through. I can understand where people are like I just I'm just done. I'm just tired. I'm going to enjoy what Star Wars meant to me, and I just can't get back into this anymore because it's going to be more drama moving forward. Yeah, they're, they're just they're they're waiting. It's 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 I hate to say it. It's 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 like the uh, you know the abuse victim that yeah. just is waiting to get hit one more time. And I mean, I'm not trying to belittle that kind of situation, but it's psychologically, it's a very similar thing. There, there is an emotional abuse on an archetypal level when you take away people's yes. dreams and hopes, and you know when yeah. you insult their heroes. It is actually very perfect. Most of us, you know, when you saw the reaction to mm -hmm. Luke Skywalker coming back, worldwide YouTube videos of people crying. Crying, yeah. not fake crying. This is real, authentic emotion. So yep. when you had that character disrespected and the franchise disrespected, it it's like it's like insulting people's religion. It's something very deeply personal, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it, when you like you know, it's I've had this happen directly. You know, be, you know, people on you people on social media will attack my religion and say, "But well, we can still be buddies." I'm like, "No, we actually can't. I don't have the energy for having somebody like you who, who can't respect the privacy of my own beliefs." Just, you know, and you expect me to suddenly engage you. I'm like, no, I'm not going to. And I've had that directly experience, uh, you know, multiple times now. And so I'm like, I can understand why people would be so hurt and feel abused by Disney. They're like, look, you know, you're, you're messed with something that's very personal to me. Mm -hmm. it's not, I'm just walking out of this situation. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have walked away. They just, they don't, they don't want to get that one more gut punch and I don't blame them. Hopefully. And I know it's going to take some time that if, 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 they're going to get on the course of really trying to rebuild this respectfully that eventually, and it may take years, Disney, you're going to have to be patient. You broke it. You bought it. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually you bought it. You broke it. Now you bought it again. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, this is where we and, are. And, and you're still bumbling yeah. through this. You're, you're still, still bumbling, bumbling the PR this. of this. Yeah. You're bumbling yeah. all the PR of this, you know, 
it's it's just the 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 sadness of the last year when everything was going great after after the return of Luke Skywalker and then just the bumbling PR of the whole thing to this day and the 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 constant shell game with Miss Kennedy and her fate it's just 101 bad PR from business school and oh yeah yeah so yeah well and and that's what I think but that being said I I am you know I watched the first episode mm -hmm. I think my reaction to it was uh largely very much like your own mm -hmm. uh, i really i it didn't i was okay it's fine it's it's i'm willing to give this some breathing room yeah same i way. understand i mean i was not surprised at all with the opening moments and the content of the flashback they had yeah. and quite frankly i think it was something that was so roundly discussed for so long yet you'd have to be more surprised if it hadn't been in there yeah um, and you know how he's still here. That being said, I, I agree with you very much on one point when it came to like the Mandalorian, that first episode that we got, you get to the end and you got this amazing hook, the little ears perk up out the basket and you see the big eyes and you have baby Yoda Grogu. We didn't get that power moment. We didn't get that yeah. hook at the beginning, at, at the end of this. Yeah. Episode. And, and they may have thought that, you know, yeah. spoiler there, there's a baby or there's a child uh sand person right mm -hmm. sand people you know and mm -hmm. there's a child there the and and but that doesn't have the the cuddly cute factor of of a yoda i don't mm -hmm. know that people are going to go out and buy uh you know sand people dolls i mean we bought them as kids i don't know they're going to buy them with the same intensity that people bought this cuddly yoda baby i just don't think that's if that's the angle that's not the angle and you didn't have you know you you didn't have that moment that you stepped away from the pile of the Mandalorian, which a lot of us were like, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to work. We watched it. It surprised us. You know, you know, the, uh, by the time I'd watched, I was familiar that baby Yoda existed because obviously I watched it a year and a half after it premiered. Right. But th the way it was executed was very well done that, you know, you have this guy and then he, then he, then he takes out the, the, uh, the droid that's going to kill the baby. And that was very well done emotionally. You're like, okay, this guy, this loner has now mm -hmm. put himself on the path of this baby. And what's, what does that mean? Right. And I was invested right there. I was invested right there. And here I'm like a character that I'm already invested in. I wasn't, much more invested in as a result of this pilot. So, and it had me, had me had with a lot of questions. I have to wonder, and you know, as a writer, Cameron, I, I'd be mm -hmm. curious to get your opinion on this. Um, because it seems to me, you know, with that first episode, you know, we, I think we saw this with WandaVision for the first time mm -hmm. where originally that was supposed to be a six episode set and they stretched that sucker out to what, eight or nine. Yeah. So they obviously went back after things had been kind of shot or at least planned out, but probably shot. And then artificially rebroke up the episodes into episodes or breakpoints that they were not intended to be. Yeah, they they would have used editing. I don't think they had the time to go do reshoots. Exactly. So that I'm wondering if and if so, how much if that affected this show. Because I think this was supposed to be, or it is supposed to be six episodes, or mm -hmm. maybe Seven. That's what I heard. I heard. It's a it's a short order. Yeah, uh, it's I know it's a seven, limited series. I heard. Yeah, it wasn't ten, which surprised me. I'm like, I have a little more confidence in this. I mean, Mandalorian was ten, right? Uh, eight, eight, okay. eight. Right. Yeah, okay. eight. Yeah, which uh, Obi Wan Kenobi is only slated to be six. And and here here's part of my thinking. And again, from the business side of things, yeah. If you lack consistent content, new headline content to put onto your streaming service. That is what Wall Street is looking at as the end all be all, not just for Disney, but for AT and T with HBO yeah. Max, Paramount Plus, uh, uh, Peacock, and all this other stuff yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter with the real revenues. The people just, uh, for whatever reason, they're hung up on subscription numbers. If you have to hold subscribers, and you can stretch one or two extra episodes out of a show that's already been put in the can and thereby forcing maybe a million or two viewers to have to hang on one extra month's worth of subscription. Yeah. This is what they're doing. And I'm not kidding the people out there watching. This is how they think. If I'm a Netflix, even though I drop 10 episodes of Cobra mm -hmm. Kai in mm -hmm. one day, 
Yeah. They have so much other stuff in the pipe. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And the look, binge I, model I, for Netflix works, but for yeah. all these other streaming services, they have to do the weekly release because if they binge it out, like if they put every episode of Boba Fett out there on December 29th, by January 1st, a couple million subscribers would already be out the door again. Because there's nothing to, to follow up on immediately. Right? Exactly. You know, yeah. I, I I went and watched, I loved Cobra Kai. I went, I watched, I watched the fourth season. I loved it. And then, you know, and the Netflix right after I finished was give me all kinds of recommendations to go watch that. And if I wanted to, there's there's more than enough I can watch after yep. that, right? Uh, and so, but, but Disney, if it's going to do this kind of thing with Disney Plus, it's got to have perfectly mapped out the, uh, the release schedule. So the moment this ends, I'm hooked onto the next thing. But right. I don't really get the vibe that I don't know what's coming out after Boba Fett. I don't know that I'm watching anything. I don't know, you know, will I continue to subscribe? Will I take a break until maybe Obi-Wan? I mean, hopefully, you know, I don't know. I, I don't have anything that makes me want to stick around with Disney Plus beyond Boba Fett right now. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And that's I don't know if they have anything. If if this holds out to be a six or seven week show, which I believe it is, I could probably mm -hmm. pull it up on IMDb. Let's assume yeah. right now it's six or seven weeks. That means by by mid February, we're winding this down. Maybe by the third week of February, I believe that Obi Wan was still on the books to land somewhere in the March April time zone. So they're well, still going to have straight from that to that. Then we're going to be okay. Yeah, and but I but I, after that, I, I it 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 starts to dry up quickly. Um, yeah. And I think I think then they start bringing in some more of these Marvel shows in the second half of the year, but those have not done terribly well. So I mean this, and this is the kind of thing now, right now with streaming and theatrical releases. Disney has just they've really struggled. Obviously, everybody struggled in 2020 when it came to this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they did have the benefit of having a boon when it came to the growth in their subscriber base on Disney Plus, but a lot of other streaming services did as well. Yeah. 2021. They haven't been able to keep that momentum. And again, to be fair, a lot of others haven't as well, but their theatrical slate has been not that great when it comes to financial returns. And the Disney Plus stuff so far has really not launched it. Now, Book of Boba Fett may turn it around. I said to my buddies at Echo Base, I said they better get this going by episode three real fast. Because oh, they need by episode not, two, my friend. They need by episode yeah. two. Well, I, I think I walk away I, from the next episode feeling what I felt at the first one. I was like, that's it. That's it. I agree. I, and I, can't, I, I can't go to it. I'll watch this whole thing out of commitment to it, but yep. I, 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 emotionally, I can't handle it not fulfilling me by the end of the second episode. I would agree with you. And when I say by episode three, what I mean is I think by the, the middle to end of episode two, we should start seeing the turn, as I would call it, and, and really start ramping up the pace of this. Give us a hook to bring me into episode three where I need it to really start moving and going somewhere because I agree with you at this point. If I get through the second episode, I guess this Wednesday or this Friday uh, with Book of Boba Fett, and I'm left with the same me feeling that I had after episode one, I, I, I mean, look, I turned my Disney Plus subscription back on for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll turn it right back off again because honestly, there's nothing after this. And we're seeing this with one Disney show after the next. If you have even 40, 50 million uh, you know, subscriptions in the US and you're putting out what is supposed to be your quote unquote headline yeah. shows, your big draws, mm -hmm. and you're sucking in a million, million and a half uh, views in the first five days for a headline show, that, that ain't good. That ain't good, folks. Yeah. Um, I mean, that look, I, I, I work in the CW, and those are the kind of ratings you get at the CW. But this isn't the CW. This is a global. Mm -hmm. This is a global streamer with with mm -hmm. Star Wars. You mm -hmm. shouldn't be having this, right? And uh, and again, I'm not coming from the place of the negativos who are joyous to see Star Wars fail. Who's in, there's people in the All YouTube right. world whose entire business model is based on on being angry and wanting Star Wars to fail and all this stuff and talking wokeity woke woke woke. I'm tired of that. I want I'm watching this stuff because I want to be entertained. I want to mm -hmm. go back to my childhood feeling that I captured in the Mandalorian, right? That I got that got back. I want that again. I'm just holding it to the standard. I'm not even holding the standard of the original trilogy. I'm holding the standard of the Mandalorian and. It should be able to meet that standard, right? Which is which is good, good entertaining story, good characters, lots of fun fan service with the Star Wars world, and some really epic climaxes. Uh, you know, I never felt a 
moment ever watching Mandalorian. I never felt it. Right. I was always like, what happens next? I want to find out what happens next. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and I, that's why I was shocked to have that feeling, uh, especially with this character that I care about very much. Uh, and so I really want this to succeed. And that's what I've been saying on my Patreon is I'm going to give it a chance. Right. I'm not one of these negativos that's screaming, burn it all down. I want Mr. Favreau to succeed. Uh, had I been in that writer's room, I would have said, boss, I don't know that this cut's going to work. I think we need more here. I think we got to expand this episode. And I think we need a little bit more. Like you said, we need the punch. We need the punch. And I'm sure there is a punch somewhere in these uh, that's written in there. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have to be Han Solo showing up with a blaster at the end of the pilot episode, but it has to be something that makes me go, okay. Which, oh, which may actually happen in one of the episodes. I'm which, becoming... is, which is, which I'm sure, I actually personally am sure will happen, whether it'll be on the final or penultimate, penultimate episode. But I watch Mandalorian. You know, I had watched it after hearing Luke was back, but I wasn't sitting there going, ah, let's just get to, to, to Luke at the end of season two. I was enjoying every episode for what it was when I binge watched it finally, right? Yep. I, you know, for me, Luke, when I finally watched it, Luke's return was very tasty ice, icing on the cake, but I enjoyed the cake. So mm -hmm. I'm praying to God that uh, that Mandalorian next episode that we're watching next week really gives us the punch because I'm going to stick it through. I don't know others are going to stick it through. I don't think they will. Yeah, and 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 I'm 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 starting to wonder, and I've been reading some research reports recently on the streaming outlook and the movie theater box mm -hmm. office outlook yeah. for 2022, which will, that'll be in another future video, uh, probably in the next few days. I'll try to put mm -hmm. together. Um, but it's interesting to me because they're really starting to dig into who's watching these streaming services. So I'm going to pull this one last thing up real quick before yeah. we before we sign off, mm -hmm. and you know this. Um, uh, let's see. Now it's not. There we go. No, no, there no. we go. There we go. Oh, okay. So here we are. This is Disney Plus. So we, let's go tit for tat. This is December 30th, 2021. This was from Sama TV. Of course, 2 million households watched in Kanto on the first weekend. That was, and this movie dropped on Friday, December 24th. So, so this is weekend. after the feature would have been in the theaters. After it made $100 million or $130 million okay. globally. 30-day exclusive box office release, and then right on to Disney Plus for free, not premiere access. And this goes to one of the points in some of these articles, is that, yes, Disney has roughly 45 to 50 million, as best we can tell, subscribers in North America. It may be closer to 40 now. Mm -hmm. um, 118 globally, obviously. But their subscriber base, as we can see on this, you talk about, you know, this is 2 million views in three days for Encanto, mm -hmm. a cartoon that had been in the theater for 30 days that everybody went, well, not everybody, but a lot of people went to go see. Mm -hmm. um, they can't get, this is a very odd, the Marvel shows can't get this, and they're exclusive to Disney+. Plus. Mm -hmm. The Star Wars programming can't get this, and they're exclusive to Disney+. Plus. And it goes to show that either one of two things, either these shows are terrible and nobody wants to watch them, which I don't think is wholesale true at all, mm -hmm. I think there's a limited audience for them. I think what's more the problem is, is that Disney Plus is starting to realize, or they already know, they're just not sharing it. They don't share their internal numbers. They have a lot more kids, little kids and families watching the cartoons and the classic Disney stuff. I don't know how much of their new properties are really gaining traction. Well, I think they felt like they wanted that to happen, and I think this is one of the reasons why Chapek said what he did on the investor call about they have 300-plus like new properties that they're shoving into their streaming services globally uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, because what they have been making now, at least their big headline shows, they're not the draw. We see, but you've hit the pivotal issue, which I've actually said this as well mm -hmm. uh, in the Patreon conversation we've been having, which is that maybe they just don't understand that the audience for these things, for the Marvel shows and for the Star Wars shows, is not little kids it's mm -hmm. not it's actually older people so when i when i tuned back into disney to watch hawkeye remember i i'm excited by the quality of the actors involved in hawkeye right mm -hmm. uh and then i'm watching it and i'm like th this is low stakes little kitty show that's what i felt in the pilot right i watched it like Haley steinfeld is essentially playing a college girl facing villains that are that are essentially these like comedic joke villains right and i'm like you know, this is this is an Avengers show. 
This is this is like you know some somebody running around beating up you know a, a silly criminal in New York City. That this isn't even I, I said this isn't even at the level of Daredevil, which was a very high stakes show. We you know and then with some spoilers, some of the characters from Daredevil show up in this right uh, very late in the thing that raised the stakes. But the stakes in Daredevil were very high from the very beginning. Right. The the thing is the stakes in the you know, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show on ABC that went off for like seven seasons were higher than this from, mm -hmm. you know, they were global and, you know, and that's an ABC show. Uh, here I'm like watching this, I'm like, this is, this is for little kids. I'm an adult wanting to be entertained. And the you know? budget for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was a fraction of what they're spending on these Disney Plus shows. I mean, a and, fraction. And, and I never thought, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was what it was, but I, mm -hmm. as an adult, I could enjoy it. And then, then I watch Boba Fett. And again, I'm like, this is, my perspective on that pilot is this is a watered down Boba Fett for children, right? Because the ruthless, dangerous, uh, amoral bounty hunter, you know, he's, you know, with some, with some, uh, a little bit of minor spoilers, which is at a certain point, he's captured with another alien and he gets a chance to escape. And then he's like, tries to help the alien escape. The Boba Fett I know would be, I got to survive, buddy. Good luck to you, right? And he gets mm -hmm. himself in the hot water because he's showing compassion as alien when he should just be taken. The Boba Fett we know is a self-interested bounty hunter. It's like, I'm out of here. Good luck to you. Gone. And that was, but they felt, I guess they felt that that's, you can't give children that kind of hero, right? Who's a, who's a selfish guy, right? And I'm like, well, just, he's this, the day before he was trying to kill Luke Skywalker on Han Solo. So he's not really the hero, right? So that's that dude. He's working for a, a gangster Jabba, you know, freezing and and uh, handing over uh, essentially a political prisoner to that guy. So he's not a great guy. And I'd like to see his evolution from that guy into someone that wants responsibility, like Lando Calrissian eventually got responsibility on Cloud City when he was a gambler and a scoundrel, and then he has to run this mining operation. I'd like to see that journey, but he's already starting off as like, Hey, it's okay, man. Let me help you out. That's not Boba Fett. It's Boba Fett if you want to make him watered down for children so they don't get like, mommy, why is why was Bo why was Boba Fett not being nice to the poor alien, right? And but that's not the audience for that. The kids aren't watching Boba Fett because they don't know that character. The parents know that character. So you got to satisfy them. And that's the strategic mistake that I'm feeling in the Disney shows that I'm watching, which is that they're not being aimed for the proper audience. You don't have to make it a dark rated R show, but you have to make it a serious show that entertains adults. And that's not what I got. I mean, look, from a personal experience, that's why I parted ways uh, when I was at Disney, when I was on uh, the Tron animated series. I was the head writer for that. And, you know, I parted ways, as I've been very open about, for political reasons that, you know, I didn't like some of the way things were being handled. I voiced that concern. They asked me to leave. But the official reason that was given was, you know, your vision for this show is, is too mature. Because I was very serious from the beginning. I said to them, I want to make a show that kids will enjoy, but parents will enjoy, like the Batman animated series, which is a very sophisticated it was. You know, animated show. And you didn't and have so to have, you know, by adult, that doesn't mean you have to have strong language and sexual yeah, content and grotesque need, violence. You some serious, so serious storylines. Yeah. Yeah, theme storylines. And that's what I wrote. And that's what if anyone who watches the Tron, you can watch on Disney Plus, you know, Tron Uprising, it's there. The first half of that show, which is what I ran, is that and the second mm -hmm. half of the show quickly becomes a kiddie show which is what i told them when i said look this isn't what the audience for tron wants but you want to do this go ahead right mm -hmm. and uh, and they did and they didn't get renewed at the end of the season right uh because that's not what the audience for tron wanted uh so that's i've been through that directly at disney the same thing of of making uh, with of them not understanding their audience for this isn't the little children that they think the audience is for these cartoons that they're making that are aimed for seven eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds this stuff is for 19 20 year olds and over who have the child at heart still right yeah and 30 and what, 40 and 50 year olds to exactly. 60 year olds too who still yeah. have the love for the underlying because these are legacy franchises from another generation and so that is based on my own experience. It looks like it looks like a decade later they haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, I, I think Disney has been trying to keep uh, seemingly at least anything over a very mild to modest PG rating out of Disney Plus and on to the oh we're going to put that on Hulu or FX or something else. And it's mm -hmm. I, I you know in in other countries it it seems and there's some of their international markets they've tried to coalesce some of these things down onto the singular streaming service. I think that's eventually where they have to go and break this idea. Like you said, they don't need to make this show for G rated kitty stuff. 
And you know, Mandalorian they, wasn't that. Mandalorian was no. a sophisticated adult show. You, they had the genius of Baby Yoda there that would always bring little children to watch, right? But mm -hmm. it was a real show about people trying to hunt and kill this baby, right? And uh, a guy who's put himself in really precarious situations. There's gun battles. There's all kinds of stuff happening here. People die. All that is sophisticated adult fare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, 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 like I said, I'm like you. I'm giving Boba Fett a wide berth here. I, yeah. I do really appreciate a lot of Robert Rodriguez's work. John Favreau was the credited writer on the first episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, uh, let's let's see where this is going. Yeah. I know, like you, I'm a little disappointed with the start. Although I'm not on, I'm not miserable. I'm not pissed off. Yeah, I'm startled by it. There's, there's yeah, I, we shouldn't have been disappointed. Especially it's a little bit slower than I expected. Yeah, I, ex yeah. I expected a big. I really did expect kind of a bang at the end, like they yeah. did with the first episode of Mando, but time will tell. Time will tell. Cameron, any yeah. final thoughts before we check out this evening? And and before we send everybody over to Patreon to subscribe. Well, and because remember, this conversation, again, began on Patreon this morning, right? And so here we are again. Of um, course. Patreon always triggers these wonderful videos with you, Valiant. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, my final thoughts with this is that is what I've been saying on Patreon, which is, you know, if you care about Star Wars, which I do, then don't give up that easily. I mean, a lot of people are like, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. I've heard it's not great, I'm out. I would urge you to give John Favreau what he has earned, which is the benefit of the doubt. He's earned that. You know, you can't blame him for what happened with Gina Carano. You can't blame him for uh, the the garbage that was in the sequel trilogy. He wasn't responsible for that. He wasn't. He couldn't control the Carano situation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He he wasn't the CEO or the president of that division. He wasn't. He couldn't control it. Uh, and so don't 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 take it out on this. I would give it a chance. You know, I think it's fair if you watch two or three episodes and you're like, this isn't what I want, you're out. But give it that. Give it that. I'm going to watch the whole thing and I hope, I, and I don't expect to be disappointed. I expect to be very happy at the end of this. Uh, and if I'm not, then we'll have a long conversation about where this, what that means for Obi-Wan and everything else, right? Uh, but, but give it a shot because anyone who loves Star Wars should want it to succeed. And right now, as I said on Patreon, just like Obi-Wan Kenobi, John Favreau is our last hope here. There's nobody right now in the works in that system that cares about this franchise that wants to fix it. So give him a chance. Give him your support uh, until you no longer can. And hopefully you won't get to that place. Exactly. Yeah, I, I want to be fair with it because like you, you know, as, as disgusted as I am with some of the directions that we've had this past yeah. several years, I just I look, I, I'm just give me God. Just give me good Star Wars. That, that's all I want. I, if there's somebody out there willing to do it that can do it, okay, I'll support it. Just, but like you said, until you get to that point where somebody like Favreau uh, is going to give me reason to to hate what he's doing. And again, I understand not everybody's going to like every aspect of everything he does. Yeah. Not everything he does is going to be perfectly in tune with canon from the EU and all kind of stuff. Yeah. What I'm more interested in is can you just give the franchise some damn respect? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and can, you, can not, you entertain us? Can you entertain can you, us? Can you entertain us? And can you not take a a dump on people like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and everything else in terms of just denigrating their characters so yeah. badly to where they're unrecognizable because of a political agenda or something? Yeah. So, in any case, well, Cameron, thanks so much. Make sure when you head out today before you. Leave a comment and all that kind of stuff. Check out Cameron on Patreon and go sub to him and go check out where these conversations start. Cameron, we can't thank you enough. Always fun to have you here. And hopefully this will be a good start to 2022. And we will be doing a bunch more of these this year. So everybody stick around. And in the meantime, until next time, take care.